Welcome to the next installment of the Miami Group Sierra Club Virtual Backpack Series. Tonight's topic, backpacking food. It doesn't have to be boring. It's going to be presented tonight by Holly Gage. Um, Holly has been preserving food for most of her life. and uh, She grew up with a family that had a garden and canned much of its produce. As an adult, she started experimenting with dehydrating food as a method of preserving foods. And then about uh, six years ago, she went to the Boundary Waters for a week of uh, canoeing and backpacking. And that experience really tipped over the edge and she became an avid dehydrator. Uh, testing out recipes and uh, dehydrating food for large groups of people. Uh, lots of lessons learned along the way. And today, Holly would like to get you starting uh, dehydrating your own foods uh, or up your game if you're already dehydrating uh, your own foods and share some tips on what to do and what, to, what not to do when it comes to dehydrating for really for backpacking or for uh, for any, uh, any reason. So, um, Holly, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks for the introduction. All right, we have first we have a poll. And if you could answer the questions on the poll, how do we do that? I'll start the poll for you. Oh. Oh, no. Hey, Barry. Yeah, I, I can't do it, Nancy. Yeah, it's yeah. not really a poll. It's just a slide with questions. Yeah, so there is a function on here, but it's saying I'm logged in from another device, which, uh, Barry, I think that's because we're both logged in as Miami group. <laughs> uh, okay. Is it, are you let able me, to do uh, Let me reclaim host and see if I can. Okay. <laughs> Technical difficulty, sorry. Technical difficulty, here I can, so I'm going to do it. There we All go. All right. Okay, so if all of you could just answer the poll, that gives me a sense of how much experience of people I'm talking to. So is everybody seeing the poll now? I hope nod heads or something. Yes, good, okay. <laughs> yep, we're getting some answers out there. All right, um, <laughs> Yep. 10 out of 12, so uh, we've got a couple of folks out there that uh, haven't responded yet. I'll give it another 30 seconds here and then we'll, we'll share it. And you may have to read the percentages to Holly because it <coughs> may or may not show up on her screen. Do you see it, Holly? I don't see anything. Okay. 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 We'll see. Uh, Barry should be able to do it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, looks like we've got most of the responses here. So I'm going to go ahead and end it and I believe share the results. Yeah. So, uh -huh. can you see it now, Holly? Yeah, I okay. can. Great. 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 Okay. So I've got a lot of people who have never ventured into back or uh, dehydrating <coughs> your own food, which is exciting to me because it's so awesome to do. So food is a really important part of our society. We all gather around food. We gather around uh, the dinner tables. We go out to meals with friends. And I recognized this past weekend as I was backpacking with the, the Sierra Club that my favorite part of backpacking and or going to the Boundary Waters is having meals together. And the reason this is, is because you get to sit around and just get to know people, have conversations. And then of course, food is important because it nourishes our body. And after we've been out backpacking, we're hot, we're tired, we're cold, whatever. But just sitting around a campfire and, and enjoying a meal together really brings the group together a whole lot more. So my favorite personal part of any of these outdoor adventures is food. So today I'm going to introduce you to how you can provide your own food, something more than just ramen noodles or some canned tuna. <laughs> um, 
All right. So there's a lot of confusion uh, between dehydrated and freeze dried. Dehydrated food actually, hang on a sec. Okay. Dehydrated food retains about five to 20% of the water in, that it originally had. Dehydration works through heating. So you're heating whatever food is in the um, dehydrator in order to get the water to evaporate. And a dehydrator has some sort of fan that is circulating the air within it to help with that dehydration. Freeze drying is what you typically see with, um, if you go to an outfitter like Mountain House or um, REI they, or any of the outfitters that sell prepackaged backpacking food, that mostly is freeze dried. And that is a whole different process. What happens with freeze drying is that you freeze the food and then you put it in a machine that looks pretty much like the machine on the bottom right. And it has an entire vacuum pump and it drops the temperature of the food down to like a minus 40 degrees and then it vacuum sucks the moisture out of the food. It makes a very different texture than freeze or than dehydrated. So dehydrated food tends to condense down and be a bit chewy and I don't know, think, think raisins, whereas freeze dried food is very light and very fluffy, but retains the original shape typically. So if you look on the right hand side, that picture of freeze dried food, that is freeze dried vegetables. And you can see that they look very much the same. Whereas on the left, all the vegetables in the, from the dehydrator are a little bit harder to identify. I mean, you can look in there and say, well, it looks like there's some bell peppers and some onions, etc. cetera. The um, freeze dried foods only retain one to 2% of the water. So the difference between the two when you're thinking about backpacking, dehydrated food will, um, you can package it into smaller packages, but they're gonna be heavier. Um, freeze dried food, because it retains that exact same shape, the packages are gonna be bigger, but they'll be lighter. So you've gotta decide what do you want out of your experience. Freeze dried, to buy a freeze dryer, you're also gonna be paying close to four grand, possibly a little more after you buy all the accessories that go along with freeze drying. Versus a dehydrator, you can buy a pretty inexpensive dehydrator or build your own uh, for 30, 30 to $300. The one on the bottom left is the dehydrator that I use. It's called an Excalibur. It's got nine trays. And the difference on dehydration too is that um, some dehydrators have air circulating the fans blowing up from the bottom versus blowing from the back across the food. So those are all things you'll want to consider. Um, the last thing, freeze dried foods retain a lot of the nutrients, like most all the nutrients in your food, whereas dehydrated will lose some of the nutrients. I don't know that any of us really sit there and say, well, I lost 5% of my nutrients from my beef stew. So it's not as good. So, right. Nobody really thinks about that. I personally don't. But some differences are that freeze dried food can last if you package it correctly, it can last up to 25 years or more. Whereas dehydrated food typically is said not to last that long. So here are some examples of dehydrators. The one on the top left again is pretty much like mine. It's a nine tray Excalibur. That one I love and I've used it for many years. It's been a go-to horse but maybe you don't want to invest in a dehydrator right away or you don't want to. I think mine was like $150 at Amazon garage sale or something like that. Supposedly it had a ding in it, still chugging along, no big deal. Um, but 
you can buy one like the round one on the right, the fan blows up through the bottom, but that's the kind I actually started with. My issue with it was it didn't have a thermostat on it. And because the um, fan blows from the bottom, the things on the bottom get dried first. So I would, I would go back after a few, every few hours and swap the trays around so that I would have the top tray move to the bottom and just kind of keep rotating so that the air could circulate more freely across the things. Maybe you're not ready to really invest in dehydrating. If you have an Instapot, a lot of the Instapots actually have a dehydrator setting. Now, would I do this long-term? No because your Instapot is only gonna dehydrate a very small amount of food and it's still gonna take just as long. So I could put maybe three servings in an Instapot, whereas I can put nine servings in, a, in, a, in my Excalibur and it's still gonna run and use the same amount of electricity, right? So, you know, Try it out in your Instapot, but I wouldn't think of using that long-term. There are also lots of options on the internet for building your own uh, dehydrator. You, basically, you just need sun, a little bit of air circulation, warmth, whatever, something to hold a constant temperature. And a third or fifth option there is possibly your oven. Some ovens actually have temperature settings that can go low enough to do dehydrating. And a lot of people will make beef jerky in their ovens, but to dehydrate fruit and, fruits and vegetables, you need those lower temperatures. So your oven may or may not work, but if you're in the market for buying a new oven and you're interested in dehydrating, sure, go ahead and look for one with the uh, lower temperature setting options. Okay. Next slide. All right, so some things that you want to consider when you are dehydrating, or yeah, when you're dehydrating, sometimes I get, I freeze dry as well, so sometimes I get uh, confused. So one of, some of the things you want to figure out is how do you want to package your meal? Um, hang on, just a sec. Okay, if you are going to package for a single person, you'll be wanting to put on trays for a single person. Some other things that you want to think about is oil. First and foremost, oil does not dehydrate. If you can imagine, say, um, so I did an experiment once where I, I found a backpacking recipe and I thought, this certainly isn't going to work because it had a lot of oil in it. I thought, what the heck, I'm going to try it anyway. And so I made this recipe, put the oil in it, tried to dehydrate it, and the product turned out tasting really good, except that it was floating in oil because the oil doesn't dehydrate. It made a terrible, terrible mess. So I packaged it up, put it in the freezer, and used it. But Oil does not dehydrate it, it will go rancid. So you've got to be careful. When you cook recipes, um, eliminate the oil as much as possible. You can, you can um, like if you need to saute the vegetables when you're cooking something, saute them in water. Just leave the oil out as much as possible. Now that's not to say if you use a tablespoon of oil to do something, you can still freeze dry it, I mean, uh, dehydrate it. It'll still be fine. But if you're concerned about it going rancid, say you're making something now that you're gonna be using maybe next spring or summer, you'll wanna put that in the freezer and just keep it frozen until it's time to go. And then two weeks on the trail, it's, it's still gonna be fine. Just be careful about oil. The second tip that I have for you here is the size of the food. So ratatouille is one of the recipes I'm gonna share with you. 
And most people make ratatouille with, um, with beautiful slices of the vegetables and they line it up in a, in a pot and it looks really beautiful, right? It's a, it's a show kind of dish to take to a, a family gathering. But if you wanna make ratatouille for eating on the trail, what you wanna do is cut all those pieces of your vegetables to small bite-sized pieces or small, I would say a quarter inch cut, quarter inch cubes of all your vegetables. And the reason for that is how long do you wanna spend trying to rehydrate your food? So if you cut half inch cubes, it's gonna take that much longer to rehydrate. So if you want your stuff to come back fairly quickly, the smaller the pieces, the more, the quicker it's going to rehydrate. So if you look at the picture on the bottom left, those are very small pieces of food cooked up in a uh, whatever, I don't even know what that is. It might be ratatouille, looks like ratatouille. But anyway, um, smaller pieces are gonna be your friends. The third thing you want to think about is Meat. Meat can be tough. When you go to, to um, rehydrate it, ground beef can become like rocks. So a way that I've found that I've, I've been very successful with, like when I'm making chili, instead of browning the meat in a skillet, and you know how when if you were just making chili to serve to your family for dinner tonight, um, you would brown the meat and parts of it would get a little crispy and stuff. Don't do that. If you're going to dehydrate the food, brown the meat in water. So put some water in the skillet. Use a, um, a, a blender thing, one of those cake mixer things. Put that down in the pot and grind up that brown beef with the water and break it up into very small pieces. Don't let it get browned like you would with oil in a skillet. Then you can dump off any excess water, dump off any excess oil, pat that ground beef dry to get as much of the oil out of it. And then it'll, you can finish your pot of chili. I do the same thing with ground turkey as well. So just in case you're wondering, um, finish off making your chili, put it on your tray and dehydrate it. <coughs> out excellent. It's a great meal for the trail. It's one of the ones I would recommend for you to start out as a beginner. All right, so after you make, um, in order to make any of your recipes, you can make your favorite recipes. Most, most things can be dehydrated. I've not found a lot of things that just don't work. One thing that doesn't work is anything with lots of oil. Eliminate the oil and it'll work. The other thing that I do, so if I'm making a pot of soup that I, you know, I, I found this soup recipe, it sounds fantastic. It would be great for the trail. It calls for say maybe six quarts of um, chicken broth or something. I make big pots, right? Instead of putting in six quarts of chicken broth, I only put in as much as I need. So maybe I can get away with two quarts. The problem with putting in as much fluids as you need for a pot of soup is you have to dehydrate all that off and it's just going to take longer. So reduce the amount of liquids, but when you go to rehydrate, you're going to add in the correct amount of liquids to make it into your soup. Does that make sense? Hopefully. So reduce the amount of liquids so you don't have quite as much dehydration time. And then the, the other tip that I have for dehydrating, meat that has been um, pressure cooked dehydrates better. So when you buy canned chicken, that's pressure cooked. Open up the can of chicken, dump it onto your tray. You can dehydrate chicken and add it to any of your meals. I have, when I cook for a lot of people, oftentimes I make strictly vegetarian meals and then take along chicken and other meats to add to the meals for people who are not vegetarians or vegans or whatever. And so having that canned chicken option really helps to 
um, improve a meal on occasion if, if you're, some of your folks want the meat, which in my case, some of these folks I'm cooking for do. <laughs> okay, so um, I think that's it. Go on to the next slide. So Holly, before we go on to the yeah. next slide, there's just a clarifying question. Someone is asking, uh, does butter do the same thing as cooking oil? Is it pretty much the same effect? Yes, don't, don't use butter, don't any, anything that's oil. Think of it as um, something that, yeah, it just is not going to dehydrate. Cheese does not dehydrate. <laughs> if you think of putting cheese in a dehydrator, it's just going to melt and make a terrible mess. So things like that are not going to dehydrate well. It's a different ballgame when it comes to freeze drying. Of course, you can't freeze dry uh, oil either, but cheese you can. Okay, so this is um, from my dehydrator. It shows you a, go back. Oops, I'm sorry, that was not intended. That's okay. Um, so this gives you some options for what it's gonna take for you to use, uh, to do dehydrate. Most of you are probably gonna be looking at 125 degrees for vegetable type things, 135 for fruits, and then a hundred, what is it, 155 for any kind of meats and fish. My dehydrator, I can take all the trays out and I can make yogurt, which is absolutely fantastic. So if you like making your own yogurt, buying the um, Excalibur is a great way to make some of your own yogurt. And I've never really tried it for um, breads or yeast kind of living foods but I have dehydrated a lot of herbs in, in my dehydrator. Those are your temperature settings. You can find those online. Um, it, it's pretty much, if you just do a little bit of research for dehydrating times and temperatures, you're gonna find a bazillion options, pictures and whatnot. So, just know that if you decide you're gonna buy an oven though, you're gonna need one that goes down to 125 degrees for your vegetables. Okay, next slide. All right, so now what is it that you wanna start with? There's a lot of things that you can dehydrate. Included with this program, um, I have created a file that has a whole bunch of recipes. And all of the recipes that I that are in that file, I have specifically written so that you can follow the recipes, and uh, and it's strictly written for dehydration. So I'm talking about cutting your pieces up into small pieces. I've eliminated the oil, those kinds of things. So you got you can download that recipe file that's on the Sierra Club website. The link will be given to you later. But some things that are great that I wanna encourage you to start with, if you don't cook, maybe you're just like, yeah, but I just don't know how to cook. I don't like doing this stuff. Dehydrate lean cuisines or something like that. <laughs> All of those things, you can just take them, throw them on a dehydrator and they will dehydrate and rehydrate just fine. <laughs> it's, um, those, those could be your meals. You can actually dehydrate canned soup. I didn't particularly like the taste when I rehydrated my canned soup, but you can do it. Uh, Ling Cuisine came out fine, or, or any of the, um, that one's a healthy choice. I did any of those kind of frozen meals, as long as they don't have too much oil in them, will be fine. That middle picture is fruit leathers. So to create a fruit leather, all you have to do is take some fruit, blend it up. And there's some tricks to fruit leather. If you mix them up like I did there, you will have problems because, you have the problems I had, because if you don't get the textures exactly matching, then one, one fruit flavor will dry faster than the other, and then you'll have cracks in your beautiful fruit leather. So lesson learned, but if you just, took your strawberries and added a smidge of sugar and a smidge of cornstarch, heated it up, blended it into a pulp, put it on a tray, you can make a strawberry leather. 
Um, same with any other fruit. I add a smidge of sugar and a smidge of cornstarch to give it texture. Otherwise, it's going to come out real brittle and crack. So by adding the sugar, it gives it more of a flexible texture like what you get when you do the fruit roll-ups for kids or whatever. Um, you can mix and blend your flavors, but again, they need to be pretty much the same consistency. Other one, otherwise, one will dry faster than the other. The other, the next picture over is pictures of vegetables. You can just simply dehydrate some vegetables. The easy, one thing that I consider a staple in my house, if I am out of dehydrated bell peppers and onions, I go to the store, I buy the big bags, 10 for $10 at Kroger's, throw, a, throw them all on a tray or, you know, in the dehydrator and dehydrate them and pack, you know, throw them in a, a plastic bag. And then I use them all the time for everything. But you could just, you could dehydrate corn, peas, green beans. Broccoli is a little trickier, but it still works. Um, carrots work great. Yeah, pretty much any vegetable can be dehydrated. And um, let me think, what else was I going to say about that? Oh, the, um, there are options here. So you have to think about, do you want to um, create lots of pieces and then put them together to create a meal? Or do you want to create a meal and dehydrate it? So if you look at the Backpacking Chef book, that's a very popular backpacking book for creating your own uh, meals. Basically, he has you dehydrating all the different pieces, not, not every one of his recipes, but a lot of his recipes are you dehydrate all the individual pieces, and then you add a quarter cup of this and a half a cup of that and mix it with this, and you put it together in a baggie, and now you've got your dehydrated meal to take with you backpacking. I've tried that, but for me, I'm not very good at that. What happens is I feel like, oh, that's not very much corn. I should add just a little bit more, and then I'll add just a little bit more or something else. And then I end up with this not very well proportioned meal. And I've gotten frustrated with that. So what I prefer and what's in your recipe file is to create a meal or a food or something and then dehydrate that. So if you look in the bottom left corner, that is, um, I think that is pozole. Yeah, that's pozole. So I dehydrated the cabbage separate and then I added, I took, um, uh, what do you call them, the tortillas and cut them in strips and baked them in the oven and crunched those up and packaged those separately. And there's cilantro in there that I dehydrated as well. So all three of those pieces were dehydrated separately, but then I made a giant pot of pozole and then dehydrated it and packaged that up. And that way at the campsite, we rehydrated the pozole and then garnished it with rehydrated cabbage and sprinkled it with cilantro and the tortilla chips. So that was a, that's a very popular meal with the group that I typically go out into the back country with. The, thir um, the fifth thing that is super, super, everybody loves it is watermelon. And most people think, what, watermelon? It's great. So what you do for watermelon is you slice it into quarter inch slices. And then you, um, I marinated mine in lime juice and I zested the lime. After I pulled it out of the lime juice, I laid it on the tray, sprinkled it with zest and sprinkled it with uh, a chili powder. I think it was called three chili chili powder or something. Sprinkled that on it, dehydrated it. It's like spicy candy and everybody loves it. So you might start with just the watermelon. Any of those options are pretty easy options to do. If you feel like starting with maybe um, and some other things that I found that work well are spaghetti with marinara sauce. Marinara sauce will make 
like a leather, like that top middle picture, but it'll be marinara sauce as opposed to a fruit leather. And then you just add water to it at, on the back country and you end up with a sauce. If you're gonna take spaghetti, you'll need to cook the spaghetti. But if you take angel hair pasta, that sort of cooks fast enough, that's your decision if you wanna uh, deal with how long it takes to cook. But angel hair pasta cooks pretty quickly. Then you can take your marinara sauce. But a neat little surprise here, you can dehydrate meatballs. <laughs> so I bought Kroger meatballs that were about an inch in diameter, cut them into <laughs> fourths and made little meatballs about a, about a quarter to a half inch in diameter. Baked them in the oven, blotted as much of the grease off as I could, and then dehydrated them, kept them in the freezer until it was time to go out backpacking put them in my sauce on the back, in the back country. They were so good. Everybody loved them. And another thing that I really love is meatloaf. You can slice up meatloaf, dehydrate it, and you have some really good kind of meatloaf jerky. So you can rehydrate it. It rehydrates very nicely. Another very popular meal from this past summer. That was the first time I tried it and everybody loved it. So meatloaf, mashed potatoes, and broccoli works fantastic in the backcountry. All right, next slide. So next steps, what I'm gonna encourage you to do is find something to start with, whether it's gonna be a fruit leather, whether you're gonna make a pot of chili, whether you just wanna go out and buy some bell pepper and an onion mix frozen and just dehydrate it. Dehydrate all of that, dehydrate something over the next two weeks. And then when you're done, put it in a plastic bag or a glass jar until we meet again. In two weeks, I'm gonna to talk to you about how to package your food so that you can rehydrate it on the trail. We'll talk about rehydration, packaging, storage, those kinds of things in our next session. So that'll be, ooh. Uh, yeah, October 21st. It's two weeks from now. All right. I'm open for questions. So Holly, there, were, there was a great question that came up early on. Let me go back to it. Um, David is asking, um, did I understand dehydrating loses nutrients? However, once the freeze-dried food is cooked, it does it also lose them? The, the loss of due to the heating process. So once the freeze-dried is rehydrated and cooked, won't a similar amount of nutrients also be lost? He said his wife is a nutritionist and they're trying to figure this out. Ah, okay. Um, from my research, overall freeze-dried retains more nutrients. I, I just, everything that I've reached, researched, it says that freeze-dried really retains nutrients because you don't lose, an, you lose very little when it comes to doing the, um, when, you, when you freeze versus dehydrating and cooking. Does that help? I think that answered the question. Okay. So, um, I, yeah, David I, says he was just curious. I'm sorry, go ahead, Barry. I was gonna say, uh, if people want to uh, verbally ask a question, you should be able to unmute yourself if you have a question. Uh, we would ask that after you ask your question, put yourself back on mute so we don't get a lot of background noise, but uh, mics should be open. Meanwhile, there's a, another question, couple questions in the chat box, which um, y'all are welcome to do that if you prefer, either way is okay. But Richard is asking, what's a good liner for the trays in a dehydrator? Does, paper, does parchment paper work okay? Uh, it's not my favorite. So I have the only time, okay, so... If you're using a liner in the tray, it means you have something liquid that will leak through the, um, the trays themselves have like a mesh covering for them so that the air can circulate. So when you use a liner, it stops that air from circulation. So think of if you're using one of the stacked um, dehydrators and you put a liner on the bottom tray, that air doesn't have a, a lot of room to flow. So 
I, if you have the stack trays, probably you're not going to want to do liquid things like soups or stews or um, or fruit fruit roll up things. But if you have the um, the kind that has the air blowing from the back, I use the what are they called the um, Oh, I can't think of what it's called. It's that now uh, the they're not plastic. They're kind of plastic-like, but they're viable. Is it silicone. Yes, silicone. I have silicone liners. You can buy those by the <laughs> roll, or you can buy them by the sheet. I bought them specifically for my trays, and then I put them down. I also have some silicones with a little edge on them that I've used in the past. But when you're using those, you're going to have to take this after it gets to a certain point of dryness, peel your stuff off and put it directly on the um, on the the mesh trays as soon as you can because it's going to just take hours and hours to dry, and the underneath doesn't dry. The other thing that I forgot to mention when I talked about the size of the food. If your food pieces are too big, you'll get what's called case hardening. And so what happens is the outside of something will get completely dry, but the inside is wet. Uh, I had that happen with potatoes. Mm -hmm. So you want to keep your pieces small enough that they can dry from the inside out and not just harden around the outside. Cool. There were a couple of questions about um, drying times and temperature. So um, one is what temperature would you use for lean cuisine? And the other is for, um, this is my question, is what temperature and time would you use for pasta dishes like for your spaghetti? Okay, so what my rule of thumb that I follow is if it has meat in it, I typically go with the meat setting if it has very little meat in it, but some I might go between the um, between the meat and the veg or meat and the fruit setting. If it's fruit, I just go with the fruit setting. So for the question about the pasta dish, I would probably go around the um, the vegetable setting or the fruit, depending on how I was feeling at the moment, mostly. <laughs> it's not an exact science. Now, as far as time goes, what I typically do is sometime in the evening, I'll load up my dehydrator, turn it on, leave it run overnight, check it in the morning. If the stuff's not done, I put it on for, if I'm going to work, I'll put it on until I get home from work. I mean, once it's dry, it's dry. It's not gonna get any drier, right? So. Um, it can take anywhere from, okay, factors that are going to impact your dehydration time are how much moisture is in there, how much humidity is in the air, what temperature are you setting at, and are, have you filled all nine trays, in my case, all nine trays, versus if I put five trays in, and then how wet is food? Is it soup or is it, uh, have I got banana slices in there? All of that will affect your dry time. So watermelon, I put it in at night. It's usually done in the morning. Some things take longer, some things don't. Sounds like a little trial and error. It is. And it's always going to be different every load okay. because, you know, humidity in the air at the point in time and whatever. So it's definitely, okay. you don't want to rush it, but you also just got a plan ahead. <laughs> so Peggy is asking, does Skyline Chili count as rehydratable chili? Ooh, I would. Okay, so if I was gonna try to do Skyline Chili, what I would do is heat it up, put it in the refrigerator to see if any oil comes to the surface take off any and all of that grease because I believe that Skyline Chili has a lot of grease in it. 
You would need to get all that grease off in order to be successful. And then if I could peel off the, the you know how when you put um, hot dishes in the fridge and the grease solidifies on the top, you can peel that grease off. Then uh, after you dehydrate it, package it up, keep it in the freezer until you're ready to go to the back country. Good question. I haven't tried Skyline, never even thought about it. <laughs> I'm kind of good. I have another question. This is for me. For your vegetables, do you normally cook them before you dehydrate them or do you dehydrate them fresh? That's a good question. So I typically, what you want to do is blanch them, at least blanch them. That helps to kill any bacteria on them. And then um, it'll also help to retain the color and then you can dehydrate them. But when you rehydrate them, if they were only blanched, they'll come back to that. So if you want them cooked, you're gonna wanna cook them all the way first. So I typically don't do just straight vegetables. I usually make a meal and then dehydrate that. So most of my stuff's cooked. By the way, if you do peas, peas do not rehydrate quickly. So if you dehydrate them, I would recommend that you smash them a bit before you package them up. Otherwise, you'll be waiting for hours on the trail to get them to be soft, not fun. And mushrooms, cut them in very small pieces because they become rubbery and celery doesn't really rehydrate. Hey, Holly, how about, um, have you done fish? Any fish? I did, but it didn't last very long. <laughs> I did um, basically a salmon. I uh, marinated some salmon, cooked it, and then dehydrated it. And it never really made it to the trail because it was so good. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very, yeah, <laughs> it's a very oily fish. So that's why I was uh, wanting to know too how it dehydrated. Yeah, it came out good, but I kept it in the refrigerator, kept it frozen or refrigerated. I think that one was, I made that not too long before I left. So I just had it refrigerated. It comes out like a beef jerky type thing. Okay. Hmm. Hey, Holly, um, you had mentioned pasta and cooking pasta on the trail. Um, I've had pretty good success cooking pasta and then dehydrating it. And yep. then it rehydrates pretty well. Um, right. You know, my favorite is penne. Um, I think you could do spaghetti, although I find it's just easier to get ramen or something or yeah. angel hair, like you said. Uh, but if you, I mean, that it was counterintuitive the first time I did it. I thought pasta is already dry. Why on earth would you dehydrate pasta? But if you cook it, it goes through that chemical change and then you dehydrate it, actually just add you know, boiling water to it and it, and it rehydrates great. Yep. And that's, that's from my, my experience as well. The problem with spaghetti though, is that after you cook spaghetti and you go to dehydrate it, it becomes this wild tank yeah. mess of stuff <laughs> Yeah. and it's going to puncture holes in all your bags. So yeah. depending yeah. on how you're trying to rehydrate, you may have holes in your bag. It might not work so well. So what I would recommend if you're doing spaghetti, just bite the bullet and crunch it up into little pieces. It, you know, after you cook it and dehydrate it, crunch, 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 it'll make, otherwise you're gonna end up with this giant bag of spaghetti that serves two people versus crunching it down to a, yeah. a sandwich bag size that'll serve one person or yeah. two people. So. And like I said, I think it's just easier to go buy a pack of ramen, which is already yeah. nicely folded. <laughs> for exactly, you, you exactly. And, and angel hair pasta comes in nice little pieces. And somebody showed me this summer, I saw a, it's, I think it's called soup noodles that come very, it, and it's pretty much ramen, but mm -hmm. it works as well. And, you know, we used that for spaghetti one time. Yep. So. The other thing uh, I've had fairly good success with is with ground meats, and I, I tend to do turkey more than hamburger, but uh, is adding breadcrumbs. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's something that 
I got off of that Chef Glenn backpacking website you were talking about. Yeah. Um, so it's it's sort of like doing a meatloaf, except without the egg and everything. But if you add breadcrumbs and cook it, it, it actually rehydrates pretty well on the trail. And so you dehydrate things like have your beef here and your potatoes here and your vegetables there and make a shepherd's pie. Well, I, yeah, I've done both. So I, I okay. do a lot of the uh, dehydrate separately and then construct the meal for the mm -hmm. trip. But I've also, you know, if I'm doing chicken chili or something like that, I'll do it the way you did it. I'll make the meal and then just dehydrate the whole meal. So I've done both. I just have to chime in and say that the pasta, the spaghetti, is, been, has turned out to be one of my favorite meals to dehydrate. And I do, I do, I'm, I make regular spaghetti, I cook it, and then I put the pasta sauce, either meatless or I use ground turkey, and, um, and I don't brown the turkey, I let it cook in the, in the pasta sauce. And, but I mix it all together and dehydrate all is one thing. And then I do what Holly said, take it out, put it in a bowl and I just smash it all up so that it won't poke a bunch of holes in my Ziploc bag. And it's become, I think that's my, maybe my favorite self-dehydrated backpacking meal now. The other thing that uh, I just wanted to throw out there, because you mentioned cheese and I agree hundred percent, you really can't dehydrate cheese, but I mean, when people are constructing a meal or thinking about a meal, it's okay to bring along other things that you buy, right? You don't have to dehydrate at all. So, you know, you can buy powdered cheese uh, of all different kinds. So if I have a recipe that calls for cheese, I just dehydrate everything except the cheese. And then I'll just bring some powdered cheese uh, or, uh, you know, a, a dry cheese like a Parmesan or something that keeps pretty well on the trail. And then, or, or even, you know, the cheese chunks that come wrapped in plastic, you know, uh, and then add those to the meal on the trail to get that cheese back into the recipe. You can also buy freeze-dried cheese by, um, in the cans. That's true. And you can just divvy that up into smaller amounts yep. and use that as well. Does it taste like cheese? Yes. <laughs> and I freeze dried cheese this summer. So I was in the Boundary Waters for four weeks and feeding people for four weeks. And every time they did not want me to rehydrate the cheese, they loved the little crunchy cheese bites <laughs> and, and their burritos and their whatever we put yeah. the cheese on, the chili and everything. They just loved it, just crunchy. I was like, okay, you, we'll just have crunchy cheese. <laughs> did you dehydrate it or freeze dry it? Uh, I, I didn't get my freeze dryer in time to make all of the food. So I actually bought that freeze dry. Oh, gotcha. But I now have my own freeze dried cheese. Yeah. <laughs> And when you rehydrate on the trail, are you using cold water or are you using hot water? I guess it dip, it varies, right? What I typically what we well we what we mostly do is dehydrate or rehydrate with hot water in the morning for breakfast, pour hot water over whatever we're having for lunch, and carry it with us in a lunch pack. We always have one little separate pack for lunches so we don't have to go digging through anything. Um, would sit and, you know, so like for lunches, we'd have things like a chicken salad or um, burritos or uh, tacos, um, but we could rehydrate. So the food wasn't hot by the time we got around to it. And then for dinners, we usually use hot meals. Now, if the breakfast was going to be a a uh, long soak. So like if we were doing potatoes, we would do a cold soak overnight um, and just hang it in our bare bins while it's soaked in the container. And then in the morning, it was semi pretty much ready to go. And we just heat it, brown the potatoes, add the sausage, whatever. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. You had mentioned, Ali, that, you know, there's a lot of trial and error in this. And, I, you know, I've found that if I have a recipe that just takes a while to rehydrate you know I've been trying it and it ends up a little crunchy at dinner time yeah. uh, as soon as I hit camp 
if I don't want to carry it and rehydrate while I'm carrying it, just as soon as I hit camp, the very first thing I do is add water yeah. to the bag. And then as I'm setting up my tent, as I'm going to get water, as I'm going through, you know, the two hours that we always spend, you know, building our nest at camp, that's all rehydrating. So by the time dinner comes, it's all nice and rehydrated. Yeah. Yeah. So you got to think about, so when I dehydrate food or freeze dry, I always test. So I'll, I'll take like a, a couple tablespoons of my chili that I've made, put it in a bowl, add a little water to it, kind of test to see about how much water am I going to add? Is it one to one ratio or one and a half water to one? Um, Typically, it's a one-to-one -one ratio for most everything I do. And yeah, maybe some things are a little bit soupier than I'd like. And sometimes I'll add a little more water if I want it more soupy. But um, yeah, that's pretty much what I do too. But test it before you go so that you kind of know if it's going to take extra long. The pozole has bigger pieces of um, hominy in it. And those don't rehydrate very good. So I've, I've put in the um, in the document when for the recipe with pozole, you should probably chop up your hominy a little bit. So in the future, I'm planning to take a knife to the hominy and hominy and break them up into smaller pieces. Okay. I just want to add are... a plug, a uh, quick plug about cold soaking. Um, so I've, I have this year really started. Um, I just got a dehydrator the beginning of this year and um largely what i've been doing with it is when i when i have one dish meals at home whatever i have that's left over goes in the dehydrator and um then i seal it up in ziploc bags i put them in the freezer just to make them last a little longer because i don't have a freeze dryer i only have a dehydrator and then when i'm ready to go backpacking i take them out but um everything that i've made so far i've been able to use cold soak so it's just a mm. question of leaving it soak long enough so for my breakfast, I, I put water in it before I go to bed at night. My lunches usually don't involve, well, actually, that's the truth. Sometimes hummus, but hummus dehydrates almost instantly. So you don't have to do it ahead of time. But then at lunchtime, I put water on whatever I'm having for dinner. And by dinner, it's ready. And I don't have to take a stove. I don't have to take uh, fuel. I don't have any extra things to wash up. It's, I really like it a lot. <laughs> And I can say dehydrating stuff does last a long time. I've got uh, vegetables and stuff that I still use on occasion that I dehydrated back in 2016. Oh, wow. So it's, it's yeah. still perfectly good. They're dry. It's potatoes, right? <laughs> yeah. work fine. Okay. Uh, we're running, coming to the end of our time. Uh, do we have any last questions uh, from folks? I certainly want to thank you, Holly. It's been very informative and uh, certainly encourage everyone to, in two weeks to come to uh, part two where uh, we'll get even more great information. But practice. Try and dehydrate something before that. Try yep. anything. Yep. So if Denise could launch or somebody could launch the last poll, um, I'll put a couple of links in the chat box for folks to give you um, access to the recipes and a PDF of of this presentation and I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that I can get to that. So if, uh, I don't know who can launch the poll barrier, Denise. Uh, uh, I think I can do it. Right. Yeah, I can't do it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you give us a little feedback on, uh, you know, what you learned tonight and how you intend to use it, that would be great. So I just put a link into the chat box that will take you to the page where both the PDF uh, version of the PowerPoint is, um, is is stuck on there. There'll be a link to it and a link to the recipe that Holly's been referring to. And Peggy, I see your question about if you can't make the next meeting, can you get a look at the video? Absolutely. Just save that, save the link that I just put on there. It'll take you to the page where, um, actually it doesn't take you, it takes you to the page with this one. Is, hang on a second. I'm going to put, I'm going to put another link in there that'll take you to all of our virtual outings uh one second i'll put that in there and um, then you can after it after the next one is done it'll be out a recording will be out there both of these are actually will be out there 
And those second link I put in will take you to the whole list of all of our virtual outings. So if there are any previous ones that you want to catch up on, you can do that too. Okay, great. Thank you, Nancy. All right, appreciate that feedback. Uh, Going to end that poll. And um, did we have anything else, Nancy? And just to wrap up things. So if you want to talk to folks about ways they can Okay, Get great. Involved. I didn't know whether we had those slides or not, but uh, we did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> can so, I see the results of the poll? Uh, well, we can. I'm sorry, I didn't. Uh, I'll share those. Uh, I'm just curious. Yep. Uh, okay. Uh, just want to uh, encourage people that if you're interested in uh, joining Sierra Club uh, as a active member or just as a supporter. We've included a link here to uh, join Sierra Club. Um, if you like what you see and would like to support the organization, both in this kind of presentation, but all of our environmental advocacy, like to make a donation, there's a link there. Uh, the best way to follow us as far as outings, both in person and virtual, as I said earlier, is through Meetup. And um, there's a Meetup link there. And if you'd like to join us as a volunteer, uh, we have lots of opportunities to volunteer in a variety of capacities. So there's a link for that. And last but not least, if you're uh, really into this uh, outdoor kinds of activities and would like to join us as a leader, uh, we're always looking for people who want to share their experience and their passion and their interests. Great way to meet people and make friends and uh, help the community by getting more people out there into the outdoors. Uh, so we have a link there. Uh, we have a couple of uh, partners who help us put all this together. Uh, one is Roads, Rivers, and Trails, which um, is a great outfitter resource. If you've never been there, they're in Milford. A um, lot of expertise as well as you know great products, and they've been a great asset to us in uh, putting these on. And Summit Trek and Trail, uh, your adventure travel service. Uh, if you're interested in that, we have a link there, and uh, or you can get in touch with Nancy, uh, who's also been a, a great partner in uh, putting these together. And finally, the Miami Group Sierra Club, of course, uh, is the sponsor of this. So uh, appreciate everyone uh, coming, and uh, thank you all, and hope to see you in two weeks. And Barry, uh, so Peggy is asking, she's not going to be able to join in the next two weeks, so she'll be able to log on at a later date to get the uh, presentation, correct? Yes, yep. she will. We will yep. post the uh, recording out there, the video. We'll post this one as well, by the way. Uh, you know, if there's anything that you think you might have missed or if you want to forward the link when it's out there to uh, some friend who wasn't able to make it tonight, please do so. Meanwhile, I realized that there's a, an issue with the link that I put out there for um, the one that takes you to all of the all the past webinars. So I'm putting a new one. I think this is it now. Yeah, here we go. Sorry about that. Thanks for pointing it out, uh, whoever that was. Yep, there that one is. seems to work, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Anything else quick? No. I think that's All right. It. Well, thanks again, Holly. Uh, great job. Uh, looking you, forward Holly. to trying some of these recipes. Great. Thank you, everyone, yeah. for joining this evening. All right. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye.